Tonight, Dylan Vassipoli of Birding Eco Tours is going to take us around his home ground of the wider Cloud 10 area. Dylan grew up in the suburbs of Johannesburg and the beauty of nature, and birds in particular, was instilled in him from a very young age and it would go on to shape his life. Dylan came into the bird guiding world straight after high school and, and has been leading a wide array of trips for birding eco tours ever since. Dylan has traveled and guided extensively throughout the southern half of Africa, as well as Eastern Europe, Central America, the Caribbean, parts of South America, North America, and most recently into parts of Asia. Despite all this, his home base in Johannesburg and all the excellent birding in the surrounding areas of the wider Kauteng region remain a very special place to him. Whether it is birding the mountain reaches of Sacred Bosrant Nature Reserve or the acacia thickets of the Zark Kales Drift Road, the allure and excitement of birding this area hasn't changed at all. So much so, in fact, that Dylan is now a co-author with Etienne Marais and Fancy Peacock, and he is leading the project to update the Chamberlain's Guide to Birding Gauteng book, which I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit about. So Dylan, um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome yet another good friend of mine to the platform. I'm very much looking forward to learning from you about uh, my new home ground. Um, I, I know that many of us in this area look up to you, you know it better than most, um, almost like the back of your hand having grown up in this area and, and birded so much in your relatively few years. I mean, you're still a young guy, but um, yeah, we're all looking forward to you sharing all your information, experience and wisdom with us tonight. So with that, I will hand the floor to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, and yeah, just again, greetings to everyone. I see we have quite a, a wide mix of um, folks, you know, joining us from around sort of South Africa and further abroad, of course. So um, some folks will know this area quite well and be familiar with many of the sites and some folks not. So we, I'm just going to try, you know, give a bit of a general outline of some of the sites as we, we run through them. But anyway, let me just get the screen sharing going here. Okay, great. Yeah, so well, um, anyway, from following on from the great intro that Andrew gave for me, um, yeah, I'm Dylan Vassipoli, and I'm just going to be speaking to you all about some of the best birding sites in and around um, the Gauteng province and um, sort of the immediate surrounds. So um, basically, we when we talk about birding this area, we refer to this area is sort of the wider Gauteng area or the wider Gauteng 100 kilometer, um, largely because the, the Gauteng province itself is, um, you know, the borders of the actual province are somewhat arbitrary. Uh, there's a sort of a huge bowl basin at the bottom of Gauteng, you know, south of Johannesburg that extends pretty broadly. And then it sort of it gets significantly closer towards the outskirts of Joburg and Pretoria and then sort of arcs off at an angle up northeast. So the the borders of the Gauteng province are somewhat arbitrary and it's also a, a sort of a fairly small province, you know, especially in comparison to many of the other provinces in and around South Africa. So, <clears throat> um, so we were generally refer to this area as the wider Gauteng area um, and it is pretty much as you can imagine with the name with 100k in it, just largely 100 kilometers sort of from Johannesburg and Pretoria. So geographically, for those who don't know, you know, um, this area is in the central part of South Africa. And um, it is obviously home to, you know, the largest metro area in the country as well. Uh, two big cities, Johannesburg and Pretoria, are kind of centered within the Gauteng province. And, um, you know, there's an immense amount of people. It's upward of 14 million or so that um, reside within Gauteng. So it's a, a very densely populated area. So you may also be thinking, you know, like, can the birding around here actually be any good? You know, there's, is there any habitat left or are there just sort of too many folks and too many people um, that have sort of cut down on all the natural habitat? And to a degree, this is true. You know, there's, um, especially close to the cities, habitat is limited and there's um, a few good birding sites here and there. But once you get on, get to the outskirts of the cities, you know, the, there's vast um, swaths of really good natural habitat and um, yeah, really, really good birding sites, you know, that host a wide variety of species. And then um, just to kind of contribute to the, the birding um, sphere around here, there's a, you know, a fun birding challenge that runs on an annual basis. 
for folks to basically just log uh, birds, you know, with that they record within this 100 kilometer wider Gauteng region. So we're going to discuss uh, that a little bit more. So just to show you guys here about what we're talking about. So you can see there's sort of two circular rings around the center of Joburg and center of Pretoria. Um, so this is largely what we refer to as the, the wider Gauteng area. So you can see it in, encompasses uh, Gauteng province um, entirely. And then it also incorporates, you know, various portions of Northwest and Free State, and Pumalanga and Limpopo province as well. And if you're wondering what those small little squiggles on some of the outskirts, uh, the lines on the outside of the circle, those are um, reserves that kind of, you know, fall across the boundary um, of this 100 kilometer region. So uh, just in line with the, the challenge um, sort of rules, if you will, uh, you know, like as long as you see a bird within that reserve, even if it might be technically without of the 100 kilometer zone, you can still technically record it. Um, and yeah, so this is just a, an outlier of this challenge as it is um, sort of today during the 2022 year. So you can see we're still in the first half of April, um, you know, effectively um, a quarter of the year is done. And some folks are already in sort of the mid 300 uh, species that have been seen um, this year so far. So it's a pretty impressive number already and just testament to the immense birding kind of prowess of this area. So Bird Lasser, um, you know, this wonderful free um, app, um, sort of where you can atlas uh, data submitted to the SABAP bird project and um, also just record birds kind of for your life list um, now runs this challenge. But in years gone by, it was several um, hardcore Gauteng birders. They used to have a website and um, they ran the challenge on this website. So you would create an account and you would then have a, a list and you'd check off all the birds that you saw as you went by throughout the year and sort of um, save it. And then you could also compare, see um, effectively a similar system to this. You know, uh, who else has seen birds and what some of the um, species some folks have seen. So here's just an example of one of my previous years just birding around this area. Uh, this was in 2018 or 2017, um, where I had over 400 species again within the calendar year period. So just, this just goes out to show one thing that we're going to touch on about some of the sites today is that there's some good birding close to the Joburg and Pretoria sort of metros itself. But there's also a lot of really exciting birding sites further afield and you effectively need to try to get to all the different corners of this area to truly maximize the birding. Um, you know, access all the wide variety of habitats, which gives you um, many sort of different species. So um, as we kind of run through the talk a little bit later, we're going to try focus on um, sites that incorporate a lot of these different habitats. So just, um, just so a few facts about sort of this wider Gauteng area. You know, this is an incredibly diverse area and there's been upward of 550 species recorded in, um, in total for this, for this region. Our 400 of which are pretty regular or pretty easy to see on a, in a calendar year period. Uh, obviously there's um, sort of a bit of a caveat, you know, you're not gonna see 400 birds from your garden. You will have to travel around and get to all the different habitats at the appropriate times of the year to sort of try for all the different species that do occur. But assuming, you know, you put the time and effort in, um, you, you should be able to achieve 400 without too much trouble. It's also improved significantly in recent years with the, the huge increase in birders throughout this region. You know, there's a lot more sites for birds that are being found and monitored by a lot of the, the birding community. Whereas in, you know, a decade or more ago, there were a fraction, only a fraction of the total birders working this area. And, Many of the further, further afield sites weren't really known and no one really knew what birds um, occurred there. So there's much better knowledge these days, which just only enhances to sort of the birding um, experience you're able to generate. So these numbers, um, I should also just mention, you know, are arguably even greater than what they seem on paper because Gauteng is effectively landlocked. You know, there's no coast around Gauteng. So if you add a coastline in, you know, these numbers will jump up significantly. So it's, um, it's, it's a really high uh, total for this um, comparatively very small area. And the reason for these really high numbers is because there's a wide diversity of habitats throughout this area. There's um, really good high-fault grasslands predominantly in the south and the east of the, um, the region. 
We have really uh, great broadleaf woodland on rocky hills and sandy soils, uh, primarily in the northeastern quadrants. And then we have dry acacia thornfelt that creeps in from the, the west, uh, very reminiscent of the Kalahari. Um, there's a, a wide range of various rocky mountain ranges that string throughout the area. And of course, there's also a wide variety of wetland habitats, various dams and rivers and sort of temporarily and seasonally inundated floodplains uh, that form. And all these different habitats ultimately just combine to um, offer you an incredible birding experience, you know, on the doorsteps of South Africa's biggest metro area. So um, another aspect that makes this region sort of truly exciting is that it's arguably one of the easiest places in the country and for many, many of these birds throughout the entire global range to see a lot of these really difficult and uncommon birds that are pretty easy to miss anywhere in their range. Things like melodious lark, um, white-bellied bustard, you know, these are all difficult birds that are pretty scarce and frequently missed and they're all readily sought in this wider cutting area. We're also looking at things like bushveld pipits and African cuckoo hawk, um, and then to even rarer birds like striped crake and um, river warbler. They're all readily sought within this area, which just, um, just adds to its uh, sort of uh, credentials. So this is also just a, a little bit of a quick promo here. Um, so I'm joining Etienne Marais and Francie Peacock um, in up, and we're going to be producing an updated version of the Chamberlain Guide to Birding Gauteng book. You know, this book was um, incredibly well received and put a lot of these um, sites that we now hold very dear to ourselves on the map. And um, it was, uh, of course, published quite a few years ago, about 15 or so years ago. And there's been a lot of change, a lot of new sites have come up through and some of the sites um, initially mentioned in here have changed a bit as well. So it was um, time for an update. So we, we look forward to bringing you this updated version in due course. Um, we are, of course, also extremely grateful to the Chamberlain Group and Derby Chamberlain in particular for uh, sponsoring this project. You know, they are wonderful partners to have and they've been incredibly supportful of us. And we um, uh, thoroughly enjoy working with them. So yes, hopefully in due course, we'll be able to bring this book to you guys. And we um, look forward to uh, bringing a few new sites to the uh, picture as well. But anyway, without delay now, we're going to sort of run through um, a handful of sites uh, in and around this wider Gauteng area. Um, I'll just maybe start with a bit of a disclaimer that it was um, exceptionally difficult to try and refine this down. Um, obviously, you know, I can just go on a, um, a bit of a tangent and just list um, a wide variety of sites. Um, but there's probably not too much point in doing so. So I'd rather uh, cut that down and only focused on um, sort of several key sites that cover a lot of the um, diverse and different habitats in this wider Gauteng area. So visiting these sites should put you on um, in, in sort of good stead, you know, to see your 400 species within the calendar year period, should you want to be joining the um, wider Gauteng challenge. And um, yeah, you know, uh, another aspect is that these sites are always very subjective. We all have our different opinions about kind of what constitutes a good site, what makes it exciting. Um, personally, now I quite enjoy the more far-flung, you know, more adventurous sites that are perhaps a little bit more poorly known. Um, so a few of those will be mentioned in the sites as well, along with some of the more well-known and hardcore kind of birding sites, like the Zarkhelship Road, for example, Homo Floodplain, um, Sacred Boss Run Nature Reserve and Mari Bale. So we're going to be running through all of these sites as we, we go through it. So the first site that we're going to have a look at is the um, wonderful Klipperfiesberg Nature Reserve. So this site is situated right on the doorstep of um, Johannesburg, just south of the city, and it's set in the Klipperfiesberg Hills. So the, the habitat here consists primarily of um, sort of uh, rocky woodland, and there are small patches of grassland, and um, there's a little stream that runs through the reserve as well. Um, this reserve is accessed, you know, via walking trails. So you park at one of the um, two entrance gates, as you can see in the red arrows on this map here, in the north and on the sort of south um, central side. There's two main entrance gates that access the reserve, and then you typically explore the trails um, on foot. Uh, this is a wonderful birding um, site, uh, right, again, right on the doorstep of Joburg. It's um, pretty spectacular, you know, when you walk through the area, you often can't quite believe Johannesburg is sort of five minutes away, five, ten minutes away. I mean, you're seeing all these incredible birds. 
So just to show you on the map where the clipper Fiesberg nature reserve is, obviously you can see it's with the red um, sort of teardrop arrow um, in the center of the screen, right on the south side of Johannesburg. So some of the um, exciting birds that we look for here are um, several of these kind of um, Kalahari acacia birds that creep into the hills. Things like Atlas ashy tit are, are one of these. Um, Black Kushrike is another exciting bird, usually a more bushveld species. They seem to move into the reserve during the summer months. Um, and they, yeah, you can also find them again in the woodland um, throughout this range. Another one of the exciting birds is purple indigo bird. Um, obviously, you know, these are a uh, brood parasite and they parasitize Jamison's fire pinches. So it's, um, I always find this like one of the most astounding birds. You're sort of seeing this, uh, these incredible birds. Again, you know, a bird that you often associate with Kruger and, um, you know, these bush felt areas. And here you are uh, seeing this purple indigo bird, you know, with the Joburg sort of skyscrapers in the background. Um, it always sort of blows my mind away whenever I come across one of these in the reserve, but they are around. Of course, in the summer months, um, you know, the widow birds transform into their spectacular colors. And uh, this red colored widow bird is uh, one of the, the few widow birds that um, also occur in the reserve. Nicholson's pipit, uh, another feature of the rocky um, areas at the tops of the mountain range here, formerly known as longbolt pipit, of course. Uh, these birds sort of breed up in the, the rocks during the summer area. So they're a little bit trickier to see during the summer months but they sort of come down onto the, the lower plains and often feed on the fire breaks during the winter months. So the, during winter, these birds are often very conspicuous. You sort of see sometimes even 10 of them like kind of walking about uh, some of the fire breaks, you know, that come throughout the reserve. Um, but it's a good place to see this, um, this species. And then the winter months also bring in the lively fairy flycatcher. So these are one of the, um, the winter altitudinal migrants that escape from the Karoo and um, some, some, in some cases from the Drakensberg as well, where the conditions are much harsher during the winter. So they sort of just try to escape from those harsher conditions and move into the Gauteng area. Not that it's particularly mild, but I guess it's better than um, the coldness of the Karoo and the Drakensberg. So ferry flycatchers move into Gauteng and uh, Clipper Fiesberg is also a wonderful place to see this um, super active bird. So the next site we're now going to have a look at, um, again, I saw some folks mentioned it in the chat um, box that this was one of their favorites, favorites is the Walt Sisulu National Botanical Garden. So this site is located out on the west rand of Johannesburg, sort of between Rudapuert and Krugersdorp. And it's also, a, you know, a very, very famous site. Um, I say famous uh, because it is arguably one of the most spectacular botanical gardens out there. Maybe not quite in the same league as Kirstenbosch down in the Cape but um, not far off if you ask me. But um, it's the uh, pair of rose eagles that have nested here for over 40 years that have really put this site on the map. Um, obviously it's not been the same individual uh, male and female that have been here over the years. Several different males and females have um, come and gone um, over the 40 or so years since they initially moved in. But um, the various eagles that breed in these gardens are, are, are world famous. You know, everyone knows about them. And when they come to the botanical gardens, they want to see the residents breeding various eagles. So this site is um, obviously being a botanical garden. There's quite a bit of sort of manicured um, gardens, you know, some, some artificial. Uh, but there's also some nice uh, sort of dense river rhine woodland that follows a stream running through. There is the Rudekrantz uh, mountain range that cuts through the botanical gardens as well, where the eagles breed. And so this rocky um, habitat also incorporates some slightly different species. Um, but there's also a really um, extensive portion of the, of the gardens that are uh, the sort of natural protea felt, um, sort of rocky woodland and a bit of a grassland mix out on the very sort of northern um, edge of the botanical gardens, uh, which you know, obviously increases the, the bird complement um, substantially. So just to show you again on the map where we're looking at, you can see we're out on the sort of western side of Johannesburg between Krugersdorp and Rudapuert. And of course, the various eagles are, are easily the, the most um, enjoyable species to look for in the gardens. You know, they breed here annually. Um, the birds should be starting to get ready now, starting to prepare the nest and maybe do some aerial uh, maneuvers about now. And then they usually um, breed during the winter period and 
you know, late winter, spring, the, the chicks are, are generally around and start becoming a bit active. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's incredible that these birds have been there for, for just so long. But the Averroes eagles still remain one of the most exciting birds um, occurring in the gardens. And then the stream is actually also a really good place for half color kingfisher. There's maybe only um, one bird or a pair that range up and down, and you do need a good dose of luck to, to get them. But um, if you walk up and down the stream enough and um, good fortune is on your side, you'll hopefully get a glimpse of the half color kingfisher. The reserve is of, uh, the botanical gardens, I should say, is also a great area for sunbirds. There's a wonderful aloe garden that they have here, and greater double collared sunbird in particular is one of the species that come down to the aloe garden. So again, this is usually in the winter months when the aloes are flowering, that they are particularly um, obvious, but you can often find them throughout the year with a bit of effort if you work through some of the, the rocky woodlands up above the waterfalls and on um, the protea felt uh, away from the manicured areas. There's often uh, a few birds that can be found throughout the year. Lazy cysticula is another one of the uh, birds that occur in the rocky areas. Another good bird for the sort of Johannesburg area. And uh, the mountain range is, uh, as is many mountain ranges, um, you know, they're wonderful areas for raptors moving through. Uh, this is just due to the air currents that move along and make it easy for raptors to sort of move um, throughout their territories and ranges and just kind of move around a bit. Um, of course, it also gives them good vantage for spotting prey and such. So the, the mountain range here and the cliffs at the Botanical Gardens are a great area to stake up for sort of raptors to fly by. And uh, sparrowhawks, and in particular a bamboo sparrowhawk, are pretty regular. Um, occasionally they give the eagles a bit of a hard time, although probably not as hard um, as the sort of resident pied crows give the eagles. But um, yeah, if you keep an eye out, you can often see a bamboo sparrowhawks cruising up and down the cliffs on the Botanical Gardens. And this is perhaps a bit more of a long shot, but um, over the last decade or so, uh, several seasons uh, have had grey wagtails present on the river um, running through the Botanical Gardens. So obviously this is still a mega rarity in South Africa, super rare bird uh, that comes from Europe and Asia. But these birds have a, um, a sort of a peculiar habit of often returning to the same site year on year. So with um, obviously sightings over several seasons in the last decade, um, it's always worth keeping an eye out on the river for this vagrant bird, should it appear. They quite like the sort of rocky, fast flowing sections closer to the waterfall and in the first few hundred meters downstream of the waterfall. So if you um, are super lucky, you may get a, a glimpse of this bird during the summer months. Another one of the sites that we're going to have a, a good look at is the Ritflay Nature Reserve. This is also another one of the sort of very close um, suburban sites right on the outskirts of Pretoria, just on the south side of the city. This reserve is, um, it's a pretty big reserve managed by the um, sort of Chwane um, City Parks and the Chwane sort of uh, government, I guess. And this reserve is accessed via your vehicle. So they, they have a ha handful of hides and picnic sites and such where you can get out and walk around. But the bulk of the birding is, is actually taken place um, by driving around. And you can see on this map, there's quite a, a wide network of roads and routes that you can drive that give you access to the, the habitat here. So the main habitat here is primarily high piled grassland. There's of course a huge dam and um, a few rivers and streams that run um, outside of the dam, which have you know, various water birds and there's some river run woodland associated with the rivers. But the primary habitat here is mainly high piled grassland. This is, uh, the reserve does also support, you know, quite a, a wide spectrum, spectrum of animals. There's white rhino in here, there's also cheetah and African buffalo. So there's, um, you know, there's some, some cool mammals to see as well to supplement the birding, or if the birding should get slow, there's always a bit of an added attraction when visiting Red Flay Nature Reserve. So again, just to show you on the map, you can see we ride on the south side of Pretoria. So some of the exciting birds that occur here in Ritflay, um, secretary bird is one of these um, super cool birds. Um, I'm not sure if the nest is uh, currently still active, but um, a number of years ago, you know, there used to be a resident pair of breeding secretary birds within Ritflay. And um, every now and again, you can still see them wandering through the grassy plains here. Um, but yeah, it's still a, a wonderful bird again to, to, to see, especially so close to, to the cities. You know, these, uh, these birds are also um, very easily disturbed and have a, a lot of sort of secondary impacts from sort of urbanization. 
So to have these birds featuring again still right on the doorsteps of um, Pretoria is, is pretty incredible. Uh, but so while you're driving around the grassy plains, it's always worth keeping an eye out for these um, spectacular raptors. Although quite a common species, you know, long-tailed willow bird are easily one of my favorite birds. Um, their, their tail and their display is just, just totally ridiculous. Um, it's difficult, um, you know, to, to fathom and explain. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of international guiding as well, and um, there's, there's very few birds that actually compare with this, you know, just as to how um, ridiculous it is. I keep coming back to that word, but they, they really are. Just their, their size, how they display over the grassland with this immensely long, bulky tail. Um, just, just spectacular. They, of course, are a grassland bird, so you see them pretty widely throughout the reserve. And of course, during the summer months, they have uh, the spectacular uh, breeding colors, you know, with their long tail and the sort of jet black plumage with the red and white wing patch. But they still remain um, one of my favorites, and easy, this is an easy place to see them. African yellow warbler, or um, used to be known as dark capped yellow warbler, is another one of the um, really exciting birds that occur here in Ridflam. This is a species that's also traditionally been um, more of a like a KZN, low felt and Pumalanga sort of species that's gradually over the years crept into the um, Gauteng and wider Gauteng area more and more. So if you're birding along the stream running through, through Red Flame, um, it's a good idea to keep an open for the African yellow warbler. Um, there's a, a number of birds that are, you know, are obviously resident along the, the river. You often get them in some of the reedy areas and even occasionally in some of the willow trees, you know, they'll be sitting up singing on top of the willow trees. Um, Cape Longclaw is another one of our really handsome grassland endemics that occur in Red Flame. Um, you know, also another one of the more common species, um, but they still remain, you know, an exciting bird. Uh, also, again, just drop dead, gorgeous uh, colorations. And um, yeah, the, the various roads running through Red, through Red Flame are a great place to see them. The birds often feed right on the edge of the roadside and give you pretty spectacular views. The river is also a good place for African black duck. Um, this bird can actually also be a bit interesting and tricky to find sometimes. They're not a conventional duck, you know, that uh, usually occur on big uh, open bodies of water. They're slightly more specialized and generally favor uh, moving rivers and often in sort of very vegetated areas where they can hide and sort of seek shelter and sort of just uh, be a bit reclusive. So the, the, uh, the river running through Ridflay is a really good place to see African black duck. Um, along with green sandpiper. So this is another one of the sort of scarcities and um, in years gone by uh, rarities in South Africa. Again, a visitor from Europe and Asia and the Northern hemispheres. The, the stream running through Ridflay, again, for probably the last decade or so has been pretty reliable for green sandpiper in the summer months. Of course, this is a bit dependent on the level of the river, you know, it fluctuates quite widely. Um, with If there's a lot of rain in Gauteng, for example, the river's often very high and the sandpipers not around, but when the um, water level drops quite a bit, the sandpiper is often present and the, the best place to look for it is at the, the Flay Bridge. Um, it's effectively uh, sort of between the two, you know, the big Marais Dam at Red Flay and the smaller um, dam with a picnic site in the sort of southern part of the reserve. There's a particular bridge there, Flay Bridge, and that's um, the best place to look for this um, species. So we're now going to move to one of the, the premier birding sites, uh, not only within this wider Gauteng area, but also within South Africa as a whole, and this is the Zach Gailswift Road. Several folks mentioned the site as one of their favorites in the, the chat box earlier on, and um, it's very easy to see why. You know, the site is, is pretty legendary amongst birders. Um, because it has uh, a lot of these dry western um, specials that creep in, very reminiscent of the Kalahari, things like Crimson Breasted Shrike sort of spill in. But arguably, one of the areas or one of the uh, sort of fast factors that have put this site on the map is that it, during the summer months, and especially in years of good rainfall, this area sort of transforms and it hosts a wide range of these really spectacular um, sort of tropical species. A lot of warblers push in, you know, from the, the European breeding grounds. And it's a good area to see, um, you know, very, very skulking species like river warbler. And additionally, there's a huge floodplain. Um, so this road is effectively based on uh, the Pinars River that runs um, sort of east-west um, 
through this area. And there's various sections where the river sort of spills out into a, this big uh, flats, plains area. And during also years of good rainfall, obviously the river bursts its banks and it spills out into this um, vast floodplain. So we are going to actually look at the, these floodplains in a separate site in a little bit, the Homo Homo floodplains. And for now, we'll just touch more on the Zark Halstrup Road as um, the habitats are actually quite different along the two. But so the Zark Halstrup Road, as you can see in this photograph taken quite recently, one early morning, um, you can see it's, it's quite a, a dry sort of looking area, aside from the giant puddle in the middle of the road. <laughs> but that's, um, if you come to the area, you actually you're often a bit surprised that this area has such a good birding rating as what it does, because it's, it's consists primarily of this very sort of mature acacia woodland. And it's, um, yeah, the, the, the grass and the vegetation is, is generally pretty dry as you go along the road. Um, of course, you know, during the rain, you know, there's various pools and puddles that form on the roadside. And the river, of course, does flood and uh, burst its banks in a few places. But by and large, um, a lot of the specials that you look for on this road are a lot of these more typical Kalahari thornfelt birds, uh, which are argumented in the summer months by a lot of the, these more tropical species, various warblers and cuckoos and shrikes and so many more. This is easily one of the best birding sites, not just within the region, but just, you know, within the entire sort of Southern African area. There's few areas where you can also just have such diversity, you know, uh, often in the morning, by the time you have breakfast, you're already well north of 100 species for your day, sometimes even around 130 or 140 by sort of eight in the morning. Um, you know, it's just, it's, um, it's just truly incredible. And there's few places where you have this diversity that exists on this road. So just to show you on the map where we're looking, we're now obviously quite a bit further afield from Joburg and Pretoria, and we're well north of Pretoria. It's, uh, the site lies about 45 minutes north of Pretoria, roughly, and also roughly about an hour and a half from Johannesburg, just off the N1, sort of between Pinas Rafir and uh, Rustavinta. And then it's just a gravel road that runs east-west um, through this region. So touching base with some of the resident species that occur here that are obviously uh, always worth trying for are things like Mariko sunbird, um, this is also a more bushveld oriented species that occur quite widely throughout the bushveld areas of the country. Nevertheless, truly spectacular and always an exciting change, you know, from the usual amethyst and white belly that we are, are accustomed to in and around Joburg and Pretoria. And then some of the more exciting acacia specials are things like this Cape Pendulite tit. So these are um, the, like the smallest birds within South Africa, the Pendulite tits. They weigh sort of around, roughly around 10 grams, you know, so it's, it's also difficult to fathom just how light these birds are and how small they are. Um, so Cape Pendulant tits is also one of these tricky birds that are pretty difficult everywhere in their range. They occur quite widely in these sort of drier, thorn felt areas, but they're super inconspicuous with their, um, their size, their habits, um, they range around in these sort of family groups. And their call is actually also, it's, it's a really high pitched call and it's pretty easy to miss. Um, so, you know, just as an example, it took me quite a while before I was I even able to see this bird, um, you know, for the first time as a lifer. And since then you sort of learn how to uh, find this bird and pick them up a bit more frequently. But uh, the Zark Hellsworth Road is a wonderful place to try for Cape Pendulite. Another one of these small LBJs that occur along here is burnt necked Eremomela. Also another um, species that are sort of super lively, really small, similar, superficially similar to the Cape Pendulite tit, but a little bit different, you know, with a pale eye and a little bit of rusty patch on the, on the throat. Um, we also touched on briefly in the intro about this area, but Crimson Breasted Shrike is one of these uh, spectacular Kalahari sort of specials and endemics that um, occur on the road and are, they always, you know, a, a wonderful joy to see you sort of birding in the woodland around here and um, you get this bright uh, flash of this uh, sort of blinding red almost and you always know that the crimson mist of shrike is not far away. Now during the summer months and in wet years um, a lot of these tropical species creep into the area and the Zarkhelsdorf Road is arguably one of the most reliable places for dwarf bittern and this is one of these really sort of um, exciting species that pitch up you know, they, they're super nomadic, they follow the reins around and they um, so, so sort of will move into an area pretty quickly after, after it rains and conditions become suitable and they, 
very rapidly breed and then sort of move out the area. So regardless of whether there's a huge amount of rain or comparatively a sort of a slightly less wet season, um, there's invariably some dwarf biddens to be seen along the Zarkhelsrup Road. This year in particular, there's, there's been quite a number of birds, especially sort of roughly halfway along the, the Zarkhelsrup Road at Crake Road. There's been up to five dwarf biddens that have been seen on and off Crake Road. So these birds are, you know, they're pretty inconspicuous. They're, they're also not an easy bird to find with their calling. If you do know the call, you can pick up on their call. They have a sort of a very rapid booming sort of sound. They, they generally give this in the early morning and late afternoons. But um, the, the easiest way to find these birds is to could go to some of the open sections, you know, where the river can still uh, burst its banks a bit and spill over into these sort of more plains areas. And then just to scan the, the trees and bushes and such that dot these open areas, because these birds often um, perch up conspicuously. Um, so if you scan enough of these areas, uh, you'll generally find a dwarf bitten in the appropriate habitat. So this year has been particularly very, very good for dwarf bitten along the road. And arguably the bird that put this area on the map is river warbler. So for those who have tried to see this bird, you will know it is a master skulker. They are um, really, really difficult to see. Um, they're not, uh, and they can be fairly abundant, you know, in, in wet years, in appropriate years. This year, again, for example, has been a really good year for river warbler. There's been many birds present on the Zarkhelsrup Road. So especially um, during the right time of the year, which is usually during March, these birds, start to get quite vocal, you know, prior to their departure. These are migrants, of course, from Europe. And uh, just prior to their departure, they start to call and sing. And, um, you know, just prior to their departure. And then, of course, they'll go up and breed shortly, shortly after they arrive back in Europe. So this March period is, is easily and only the well, sort of the best time to, to see river warbler because you can actually sort of track down where they are in the thickets because they are starting to call um, a little bit. But uh, make no mistake, hearing a river warbler and seeing one are two very different things. So, um, yeah, I've spent many years um, trying to show people river warbler. And uh, this photo itself was taken on the Zarkhelsdorf Road um, in 2015, again, during another good year with several birds present. Uh, I was with some birding mates and we actually we were there sort of super early um, in the morning. And we got lucky with one bird that popped out of the, the deep, dark thicket it was within and put on um, a little bit of a show uh, for maybe about five or 10 seconds or so before sort of disappearing deep into the, the thicket. Um, so I got extremely lucky to, to get views like this. Most folks don't get views quite like this. You know, you often, you'll get bits of the tail or bits of the head sort of pop, popping around within the deep thickets, maybe a meter or a meter and a half or so off the ground. But they are truly, truly um, really difficult birds to see. Um, you know, they're also one of these birds that are sort of somewhat unknown. Um, they are slightly nomadic. They do move into areas that have sort of slightly better conditions. So they do follow the rains around a little bit. But they're just one of these birds that are somewhat unknown. You know, no one really knew too much about them because they were so secretive in, in their non-breeding grounds here in South Africa. They would always just be quiet and only start calling just prior to their um, departure. And it just sort of, it's given them a bit of a, um, a high sort of status in terms of the, the birding world in Southern Africa. You know, these are a very highly prized bird because of this. And this, um, this site, the Zarkhelsrup Road has proven reliable year on year in producing river warblers. And it um, was initially what put this area onto the map. And fortunately, it still holds true to this day. It's still a great area to see um, these birds. And um, another one of the exciting resident specials that occur um, on the road is southern white-faced owl. Of course, owls are always difficult. You know, you either need a huge dose of luck to find them during the day. But if you do a night drive on the Zarkhelsdorf Road, um, it, it sometimes it can be pretty spectacular how many birds you can actually see and how many white-faced owls you can see. Um, having done several tours there over recent months, you know, one of the night drives we did, we had upward of 15 white-faced owls along the length of the, the road. So it's roughly about a 25 kilometer road. And the, the number of owls that we saw as we went along was just spectacular. So it's um, always a great sight for the species as well. 
So we briefly touched about some of the floodplains that occur along the Zorg Hellship Road. And uh, the large Homo Homo floodplain is easily the, the best and again, most famous of these floodplains, um, just due to the access uh, around it. So effectively the Zorg Hellship Road ends when you get to the Homo Homo floodplain after 25 or so kilometers, which is sort of a very rural village um, out here. So the river effectively does spill out onto this very flat area. And during wet seasons, it does burst its banks and it sort of seasonally inundates, as you can see in this photograph here. So this photograph was taken very soon after the area flooded. And this was quite a number of years back in 2012. Um, so it doesn't flood to this extent every year. But, you know, obviously just after it floods, vegetation is sort of at a premium and it, um, it very, the vegetation here very quickly grows. So for those who have been to Homo Homo um, this current season, you'll, it, this is a, a view sort of taken from the main tar road where you do a lot of the wetland birding. And you'll, there's a the huge difference you'll see is in the vegetation and that this year, it's also very, very wet here. There's just, it's very, very dense now because obviously the vegetation has had several months to, to grow so the birding becomes slightly trickier uh, just because there's um, a lot more areas for these um, sort of species to hide in. So the floodplains around Homo Homo are, um, you know, sort of the main attraction. And uh, they bring in a lot of, again, of these more sort of subtropical rains migrants. Various crakes and relids uh, are some of the most exciting species that move in. But the, the plains themselves also host um, a number of exciting birds. And there's also really good um, dry acacia thorn felt just around the, the village itself that has um, somewhat more reliable um, sites for other species that you can get on the Zarkhelsriff Road but are a little bit trickier. Things like Great Sparrow, for example. You can get them along the, the road, um, sort of leading up to the floodplain, but they are much more reliable around the actual village and the floodplain itself. So anyway, again, just to show you on a map, we're in a very similar area to the Zarkhelsriff Road, just effectively a bit further away from the N1. Um, and um, one of the exciting species that occurs on the floodplain edges is blackwing pradenkol. So these are a bird that have a, a huge migration. They come from um, sort of Central Asia, um, you know, uh, sort of Western India and that uh, sort of Stan area, you know, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan and that sort of, um, those plains around that Central Asia area. And then they migrate through and they winter in sort of Southern Africa from sort of Zambia southwards. So they're, they're a bird that cover a huge distance and there's um, invariably a flock that uh, resides during the summer months around the village of Homo Homo. It varies in size um, year on year. Sometimes the, the, the flock is only a, about a hundred birds strong, but in past years, it's also been several thousand birds strong. So uh, that, this is also always um, uh, an exciting species to see. And it's quite a sought after bird, you know, throughout the world. It's a bird that a lot of people want to try and catch up with. And this is a really good area to do so. And now touching on some of the, these more exciting tropical birds that pull in during good sort of wet years is lesser moorhen. The, and um, so these birds are one of the more regular and more reliable uh, of these sort of range migrants that move in. And during exceptional years like this year, it's sometimes pretty staggering just how many lesser moorhens can actually be present on this floodplain. So birding this, um, this area a couple of months ago at the start of February, there was a small patch of maybe 200 meters of floodplain, just to give you an example. And there must have been over 30 lesser moorhens all clucking away from within this small little patch of uh, floodplain. So just to put that in perspective, you know, they sometimes come down in, in immense numbers when the conditions are suitable. Of course, slightly different to the, the more common um, cousin, the common moorhen. These birds have a, a sort of an all yellow beak with a red shield going up the, the front of the beak. Whereas the common moorhens have sort of a, a red beak and shield with just a yellow tip to the beak. So an, another one of the exciting relids that occur here um, is African crake. Like the lesser moorhen, um, they invariably present um, annually, um, although in good years, you know, they can also be present in, in vast numbers. This year, again, there were, there were quite a few birds um, present around the outskirts of the floodplain. They generally don't, um, you know, occur strictly within the wetland itself. They're often on the grassier edges of the, on the edges of the wetland, often verging even in the woodland. You know, sometimes 
you would see them walking around through the base of trees and such. So this again was a photo taken earlier this year um, of a pair just about to uh, mate in the middle of the road, um, right on the outskirts of the village, uh, early one morning. And there've been several pairs um, present um, just on the outskirts of Homo Homo this season as well. Always a very, very good place to try for this bird. Of course, another one of the really big specials that occur here is striped crake. Um, so this is a bird that's not present every year here. It really does need to be an exceptional year before they move in. The last two years have been really good and there've been striped crakes also in sort of um, somewhat good numbers. You know, there've been up to five birds reported calling and seen along the, the edges of the floodplain here. And um, striped crake is another one of these really mythical birds, a bird that's very unknown in its range. They have a fairly broad range, you know, sort of from central West Africa through to East Africa, down to sort of South Africa. But they are just very, very shy and they are very unknown. We don't know much about this bird at all, the movements that it takes. We know it's a range migrant, that they follow rains and they also sort of will rapidly move into areas when conditions are suitable and, and breed and then sort of rapidly move out. But aside from that, we don't know too much about this bird. So it's another one of these um, sort of mythical species that many people are very, very keen on seeing. And when the, the seasons are, are good and the, the rains have come down in force, the Homo Homo floodplain is a fantastic place to, to get to grips with this really rare bird. We also touched about um, Great Sparrow and that this is one of the um, really cool acacia species that occur around the outskirts of the floodplain here. Really reliable place to see this, also sort of pretty tricky and easy to miss bird. And um, the plains do also host Temmings Corsa. Um, obviously, you know, this does depend a little bit on the conditions. You know, during, if there's a lot of rain, a lot of um, sort of water around the area, these birds are typically present in lower numbers, where sometimes in winter, there can be 20 or more Temmings Corsas uh, sort of moving across the floodplains. Obviously the area does dry out and it becomes a bit of a sort of a very barren desert-like sort of dusty um, plains. And, you know, that's obviously uh, better conditions for these birds. But invariably, if you look hard enough throughout the year, there's, there's a few Temmings courses to be found on these floodplain edges. So we now move to easily what is one of my most exciting birding sites, my, one of my favorite birding sites within the wider Gauteng area. And this is the Mabusa Nature Reserve and the surrounding areas. So um, again, appealing, I guess, to my more um, adventurous and slightly more rural aspect, this reserve is uh, a slight mission to get to. You know, it's, a, it's about an hour and a half to two hours from Joburg and Pretoria, respectively. So it's quite a, quite a mission to get to. It's near Groblesdal, um, sort of well uh, north of Bronkospreit, uh, in the northeastern quadrant of this area. And um, as you, so this is a, a photo taken on the main road that runs through, through the reserve and just gives you a good um, sort of broad outline of the area. You can see it's predominantly a broadleaf woodland area, sort of pretty sandy soils. And although there's a lot of grass and you can't really see it too much, um, these um, hills are actually very rocky as well. Um, there's also a sort of really um, interesting sort of rocky rolling grasslands that surround the reserve and also host um, really excellent birding. So this site is perhaps best birded, you know, by vehicle where you'd sort of, um, drive along and then you'd stop and then walk around on the roadside edge. It's a, it's a pretty remote area um, and there's not a lot of obviously hiking trails and such to do that. So a lot of the birding is done via your, your vehicle um, and then sort of exploring just on the edges of the roadside um, next to your vehicle on foot. Again, just to show you where, where on the map we're talking about. So you can see we sort of well northeast of Pretoria now um, between Groblesdal and Bronkwood Sprite, just off the R25. Phenomenal birding site, really is one of my favorites. And um, so starting off in the broadleaf woodland, it's a really good area to get to grips with green-capped Eremomola. This is another one of these sort of pretty difficult and pretty habitat specific species. You really need to be in the right habitat um, to have a chance for this bird. This is a wonderful area to get this otherwise pretty uncommon bird. Um, and then also, although somewhat significant um, for the wider cutting area is red-headed weaver. Again, this is a bird we associate more with the locals like Kruger Park and other places, you know, and they sort of creep into the wider Gauteng area. Um, and Mabusa is a great area to see a red-headed weaver. There's several birds that nest along the, the road that runs through the reserve. Um, also, most particularly at one of the broken down, um, sort of old abandoned accommodation um, 
sort of resorts uh, that you come across in the reserve. And another one of the exciting birds that occur in sort of these grasslands, these rocky grasslands surrounding the reserve is white-bellied bustard. Um, this, this area must actually rank as the, um, the, the region of the country that has the highest density of these birds. It's sometimes quite spectacular, again, when you're sort of exploring these very rocky, hilly, rolling grasslands that surround the reserve. And, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you hear many, many different um, family groupings of these white-bellied bustards kind of croaking away on the, rock, uh, the hillsides. Obviously, seeing them is always a, a different matter entirely. The, the birds are pretty territorial, you know, and sometimes when a rival group starts calling from the opposite hillside, several of the males often fly back and forth sort of between the groups and do a lot of calling around. Um, so sometimes you do get good views like this with the birds sort of just flying along. Um, but it's a really phenomenal area to see this otherwise tricky, tricky bird. This Mabusa area is also fantastic for several difficult Franklins, like this red wing Franklin. Um, Shelley's Franklin and Cokie Franklin also occur here and are really good sites for these birds. But also, you know, it's pretty difficult and pretty uncommon and sort of easy to miss um, throughout their range. This is a really good site for these three uh, Franklins. These grasslands also support, uh, like the white-bellied bustards, they support really big populations of melodious lark. So this is a, a bird that's almost endemic to South Africa. It's got a small sort of isolated population in sort of southern uh, Zimbabwe, I think it is, that's sort of very dis disjunct. But otherwise, this is a bird that's sort of restricted to the, the grasslands of central South Africa. Um, also, it's a bird that's somewhat unknown. You know, they're only really possible during the the summer period when they're displaying and they're vocal and you can track them down whereas in the winter they sort of tend to disappear or at least that's what we think they probably do just uh, become a bit more low-key and uh, a bit more skulking but they probably are around but you know it's a bird that's not seen outside of its um some sort, of, sort of summer breeding period um, again just testament to uh, the numbers of birds that can be uh, i was out birding um, this this area at the end of december last year with some friends and at the, the one stop um, where we sort of pulled over to try and see if we can see a melodious lark. We were actually, our jaws sort of hit the floor when there must have been upward of 40 melodious larks just all displaying and calling and going crazy from this one particular spot. And the site went on for, you know, several kilometers. There were, we had several kilometers of this. So the, just to think the number of melodious larks that must have been there must have been just tremendous. And then sticking with the LBJ theme that, you know, we've been on with the, the larks here, this area is also great for the two sort of dwarf puppets, if you will. You know, uh, these small dwarf striped puppets. Um, in this case, bushfire puppets. They are, as the name sort of suggests, they tend to be in the, the wooded areas. You know, they're, they're quite like perching in trees, but you, they do need obviously open ground to feed in. But Mabusa and especially the, the woodlands sort of just adjacent to the main road, it's a fantastic place to try for bushfire puppets. Again, another one of these really sort of pretty difficult birds, very easy to miss. And then it's very close, uh, close related cousin, short-tailed puppets. They actually have sort of only recently been discovered in the, the grasslands just outside the Busan Nate Reserve. But again, you know, pretty annually and during the summer months, these, these birds move in in low numbers. And if you know sort of, sort of where to look and how to see these birds, um, this is a really good place to see this also really difficult um, species. So the site to see this bird is on the Verena Spa Road. Um, just south of the, the entrance to Mabusa Nature Reserve. But it's, um, this bird is your ultimate LBJ. You really need to know what you're looking for and what the bird sounds like to have any chance of seeing it. You know, they, um, they occur in the grassland areas and they're really difficult to actually see on the ground. So you don't see this bird walking around a huge amount, mainly just as they're flying around and displaying and also chasing each other and such. But at first glance, you know, these, these birds look, as you can see in this photograph, they look just like a bishop or a non-breeding bishop and widow bird. So you've got to look for the sort of slightly um, disproportionate with its short little tail. And obviously, you know, weird sounding call, but that's how you sort of track down this also really highly sought after species. And now um, sticking up with a the theme. So we're focusing on another site in this northeastern quadrant, um, sort of northeast Pretoria. And this is easily one of the, the biggest rarity hotspots um, in this Wadagauteng area is the Mkumbo Dam Nature Reserve. 
So this dam, um, you know, the water levels fluctuate massively um, during this dam. And as you can imagine, it's primarily a, a wetland site. The, the main attraction are primarily the water birds, although really good acacia sort of and woodland birding exists around the edges. So there's a lot of exciting birds that can be found here as well. But the primary attraction here is the, the water birding. So this is a photograph in years gone by. Um, this was a photo taken maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, the dam is, is uh, the water level has sort of dropped markedly uh, since then. And although it's increasing a little bit again now, it's not um, at its uh, fullest uh, what it was sort of around 2010 or so, I guess, when the dam was at its ultimate peak. It was, um, so for those who don't know the site, you effectively drive through this acacia woodland until you get to, until, well, until the woodland ends. And in about 2010 or so, the water was quite literally right up to the, the edge of the acacia woodland. You'd have to drive through small patches of the dam, you know, to access the track that kind of went around the edge of it. Um, and in sort of in the last couple of years, you know, you'd reach the edge of this woodland and then you'd have to drive for one or two kilometers out over these vast floodplains or these sort of dry plains, of course, now where the dam sort of formerly was before you would actually get to the water. So the water level has dropped markedly, but it hasn't um, sort of seemed to affect the rarity status of this place. Obviously the water bird numbers aren't quite um, as much as what they were when the dam is at its uh, uh, peak, um, but there, there's still a very uh, good number of rarities that always get seen at this, the, this dam. So if you uh, fancy trying for a rare shorebird, um, this is easily the place to do this within the Wada Gauteng area. So just to show you again on the map where we're looking at, so the Mkumbo Dam Nature Reserve is again up northeast of Pretoria and east of Rust Winter. It's a little bit more remote, also a little bit more adventurous. Um, one needs a bit of a sense of adventure to, to get there, but it's well worth the trek out there, just with the immense birding potential that it has. So the dam is a really good stakeout for Western Osprey. So um, for uh, this is a species that's still a little bit difficult in South Africa. They occur quite widely and you can get them around the coast and sort of right throughout the interior of the country at any large water bodies, but they're nowhere really common. Um, there's um, sort of a very regular and resident or seemingly resident Osprey or two that are, are generally around the dam. This photo was taken there a couple of years ago with a, um, a fish of, of sorts in its talons. Um, and during the summer months, blue cheek bee eaters also move into the area. And these are, again, are European migrants and that just come down for our summer and they occur all around the dam edges. And here you can see a little trio of them all huddled up uh, early one morning, sort of on the, the edges of the dam. Like the bee eaters, the edges of the dam also attract Western yellow wagtail. And um, several of the, uh, the villages around the dam, you know, graze their cattle on the floodplain and the, the, the grass sort of on the edges of the dam and these plains that exist. And um, the, the wagtails actually sort of follow these groups of cattle around. So invariably, if you go during the summer months, sort of between September to probably March, April, and you effectively have a quick look around some of the cattle, you'll invariably see there's a few of these um, Western yellow wagtails often in a lot of different um, color stages and color morphs. Obviously this is a species uh, with a lot of subspecies and that have different colorations and different color patterns. So it's often quite fun, you know, trying to pick out how many of the, these different subspecies you can um, find in between these sort of groups of cattle, which they sort of almost uh, religiously feed um, in between. So now getting onto some of the exciting shorebirds that occur here. Caspian plover are um, a fairly regular bird during the summer months. They generally need more drier conditions because they are a bird that, although this bird is in the water, you know, they generally feature more on the plains that sort of surround the dam. So, um, you know, when, whenever there's a bit more of a, a flood plain and open flats that exist, it's a good, a good uh, sort, of, sort of stage that indicates that Caspian plovers might be around. Um, pectoral sandpiper is another one of the, the rare species that are seen on a somewhat regular basis. Obviously, all these pectoral sandpipers are, you know, they are uh, American vagrants. So they, they're not, um, they don't fall under the European breeding sort of area, which a lot of our shorebirds, things like little stints and wood sandpipers and such do. These birds, uh, you know, breed in the Americas and migrate between North and South America. And they generally need more sort of severe weather conditions to blow them. 
totally across the Atlantic Ocean and they come into the African sort of system. But um, the, if you, obviously this is a, a massive dam and you know you, there's only sort of so much of the, the dam edge you can cover. But if you bird around enough and you look at enough birds, there's always a good chance of finding pectoral sandpiper at Mkombo Dam. And uh, just sticking with uh, the rarity theme as well, you know, this is a great place for uh, many rarities. Blacktail Godwood, as pictured here, has, has been seen over the years, as has, have several other coastal species, you know, that are um, seen on their migration down. Things like Bartail Godwood and Sanderling, Ruddy Turnstone, even birds like Eurasian Wimbrel and Eurasian Curlew, you know, they have also been seen at this dam. And even pretty sp spectacularly, there was um, a Eurasian oyster catcher that was seen at the dam last year. You know, this is a bird that's, you know, still a pretty rare South African species. So to have one at an inland site is virtually unheard of. So that was um, just, you know, totally incredible. So if you want your dose of uh, rare, rare birds, Mkombo Dam is the place to do this within the wider Gauteng area. And then another one of the um, really exciting and very interesting sites that one sort of needs to cover in the, the wider Gauteng area is the Bolcher River Valley. This is another one of the sites um, on the eastern quadrant of the area, um, sort of just north of Bronkospreit. And although this photograph, th this photograph I actually had um, a lot of doubt putting in between because it was taken at the end of winter when the sort of the area arguably looks at its um, least attractive. You know, it's very dry and dusty and you can see there's sort of a lot of sand and dust that's coating the trees surrounding the roadside edges. But the Volker River Valley is one of these truly spectacular birding places. For those who haven't been there, I strongly encourage you to go. If you, should you find yourself with a bit of free time in and around Joburg, very easy to do on a day trip, of course. Um, you know, it's maybe an, an hour from Pretoria, a little bit more from Johannesburg. And uh, it's effectively this sort of woodland basin that exists um, with this, these sort of spectacular rocky cliffs that sort of follow the Vilcha River through this, um, that, uh, this sort of valley birding area. So there's a wide range of bushveld birds that occur here, a lot of woodland species. You also get a lot of rocky species, rocky more mountainous species that occur here. And then the Volcha River, you know, supports a, uh, a really interesting network of birds. It's a good place to try for things like African finfoot and half collar kingfisher. And additionally, in between the, the, the cliffs and this, these sort of rocky uh, gorges here, there's um, almost forest-like habitat, uh, this sort of very moist, dense riparian woodland which hosts a lot of really interesting species. So just to show you on the map where we're looking at here, we sort of south of the Mabusa Nature Reserve, we looked at a little earlier, and we're north of Ezenvelu Nature Reserve, but um, still off the R25 between effectively Bronkospreit and Hroblesdal. So some of the woodland birds that um, exist here are things like white-crested hummertrike, and um, some of the, the rockier birds um, are birds like striped puppets. Again, really reliable place to see striped puppets. Um, and our testament to sort of the extraordinary nature of this site is that the, there's a lot of these more tropical birds that start creeping in here. Testament to ashy flycatchers occurring in the valley. Again, this is a, a KZN bird, you know, a bird that we associate with Kruger and parts of KwaZulu Natal, not really the wider Gauteng. And here you can see this bird actually within the borders of Gauteng province. So pretty spectacular. And another one to be aware of is spectacled weaver. Another one of these birds that just creep into the wider Gauteng area, particularly at this site. You know, another really, really cool bird um, to look for here. Um, as is African goshawk. Um, again, sticking with this sort of more tropical theme. African goshawk spill into the, the valley and it's a pretty reliable site as well. Um, it's a bit tricky. The forktail drongos have actually cottoned onto its core quite well. So the, the forktail drongos do an incredible, incredibly perfect mimic of African goshawk core. So uh, don't be fooled if you hear what sounds like African goshawk in the valley. Just make sure it's not a drongo mimicking it, because they're particularly good at mimicking African goshawk in the valley. But uh, don't uh, don't be fooled. Oh, the the goshawks are around in the valley as well. Um, of course, these birds have also been seen, um, interestingly, you know, in some of the Johannesburg uh, suburban areas as well. Um, like the, the Fairland area of Joburg has had an African goshawk for some time. So not totally restricted to the valley, but it's a really good area for this otherwise more tropical species. And now the next bird that we're going to have a look at um, is also another bird that sort of really took um, this all 
took uh, all the Gauteng birders by surprise um, is Narina Trogon. There was a bird that pitched up in the Volcker River Valley a couple of years ago. I think it was in 2010 um, of a Narina Trogon in the valley. Again, testament to the sort of just the weird nature of birding that exists here. Some of these forest patches, you know, are also quite remote and difficult to access. But um, birds like olive woodpecker are in the valley as well. Another one of these sort of birds that you can quite scarcely believe occur on the doorstep of Gauteng province. Things like Cape Bathurst um, have been recorded in the past, as are things like African wood owl. So there's, there really is a lot of potential uh, for the site. And, you know, as evidenced by Narina Trogon pitching up in the valley. So another one of my uh, favorite sites, and uh, which many folks also uh, mentioned in the chat box as their favorite sites within the, the wider Gauteng area, is the Seca Borsrant Nature Reserve. So this is a very well-known, very popular birding site within Gauteng. It lies south of Johannesburg. And as you can see from this photo, it, um, it's primarily a high felt site. So there's a lot of really good grassland habitats. Um, more, there's a sort of typical grass, uh, high felt grasslands lower down in the reserve and then a more uh, montane grassland higher up in the hills. There's also good areas of rocky outcrops, and there's also really good um, sort of acacia patches, as, as you can see, uh, sort of a little bit further afield down in the valley. Uh, so there's really, there's, there's a really nice mix of habitats that occur in this reserve. There are a, a wide range of hiking trails that exist here, but there's also um, a, a little network of um, roads that you can drive around. There's probably 60 or so kilometers of roads that you can drive through on a bit of a tourist route through the, through the reserve. But this is a, a big reserve. So you, you, you largely need a combination of the two, a bit of walking and a bit of driving to access all the different habitats and to give yourselves a good chance of seeing all the sort of key specials that occur in the site. So here we are again, just on the map, you can see we um, south of Johannesburg. Actually, the site is located um, just off the N3 um, near the town of, town of Heidelberg. So easily one of the most um, sought after birds occurring in the mountainous areas at the top of the uh, sake of horse right is Eastern long Lark. So this is one of our sort of Southern African endemics. Um, they occur sort of in the greater Drakensberg area and sort of surrounds. But this is a really good place um, to see it. One of the, the best within the wider Gauteng area. Uh, and this site is also another really good place for several Franklins. This Orange River Franklin is one of the specials uh, that gets seen on the lower um, sort of high fault areas lower down uh, in the reserve, whereas the like the more montane areas high up in the hills host birds like Grey Wing Franklin and Red Wing Franklin kind of occur between the two zones. But it's a good site for all those three Franklins as well. In the winter months, Sentinel Rock Thrush uh, move in as well. This is another one of these sort of winter altitudinal migrants. They sort of push down away from the the really cold winters that the Drakensberg um, range experience. So they uh, filter into Gauteng sporadically and um, Sake of Horse Rant is a, is a really reliable place to see sentinel rock thrush during the winter months. Um, and the Acacia woodland um, is really good for many, many exciting uh, sort of more typical Kalahari specials, things like this green ring patilia, but also birds like violet-eared waxball, black-faced waxball, shaft-tailed wider and long-tailed paradise wider. You know, they all occur um, reliably and you can regularly see them in the acacia areas throughout the reserve. This is also one of the, the few areas within um, Wada Gauteng and, and I guess elsewhere in South Africa where African red-eyed bulbul and, you know, the more common dark head bulbul that we're familiar with as a common garden bird occur side by side. You often can see them in the same binocular view. So this is one of the few places where you can actually see sort of this west versus, um, or west meets east with West being African red-eyed bulbul in this case, a bird more typical of the Kalahari, meeting sort of a more um, sort of low-felt uh, Eastern um, sort of subtropical species like dark air bulbul, uh, where the two sort of overlap. And then, um, although this bird always requires a big dose of luck seeing, cuckoo finch is um, easily sought to take a boss run. And now when I say easily, I, I don't mean <laughs> necessarily finding it, but um, if you spend enough time covering the grassland areas around Sake Horse Run, you put yourself in really good stead at finding this um, pretty uh, nomadic and unpredictable bird. So these birds are also uh, brood, parasite, brood parasites and they parasitize um, the small cysticulars. So things like zitting cysticular, cloud cysticular and such. So whenever you come across vast numbers of these smaller cysticulars, 
always be aware that there is a chance that Cuckoo Finch could be around. But Sacred Boss Run must easily be the most reliable place um, I found within the wider Gauteng area and probably within South Africa for, um, for this bird. Um, the picnic site at the uh, sort of on the very uh, southern side of the nature reserve, Hulhu picnic site, was always very reliable in years gone by. Unfortunately, the picnic site has closed um, and has been for several years now, so it's no longer a good place to see them. But I still get them fairly reliably around the, the grassy plains, sort of on either side of the picnic site. So as you're approaching the picnic site and sort of after you've left it, those are, are good areas to look for for this bird in particular. And then another one of the exciting birds that have um, sort of pitched up um, within sort of recent years has been yellow-breasted pipit. This is another one of these Drakensberg birds that move around um, during the winter months and they try, sorry, pardon me, they try, you know, try to escape the cold conditions of the high Drakensberg. And um, obviously this is, not a, uh, this is not near as common a bird as like a sentinel rock thrush or even fairy flycatcher, which we looked at a bit earlier. They seem to move into the area in significantly lower numbers. But, um, you know, given one can access enough habitat at Sakerbos Runt, which is not always possible um, given the, the roads that you can drive and the trails that you can walk along, if you were able to access enough of the habitat at Sakerbos, you'd probably find yellow-breasted pipit to be pretty regular during the, the winter months. So for now, most folks need to generally wait for a bird to be seen in the roadside or just on the edges of the road um, for birders to see them these days. But um, this bird is, is I'm, I'm confident is a, is a regular winter visitor to the Sacred Horse Front Hills and some of the surrounding hills as well. So moving on to Mari Vale Bird Sanctuary. This is another one of um, Gauteng and the wider Gauteng area's most famous birding sites. Been around for years and years. Uh, Mari Vale is of course a, a Ramsar wetland. So this is a wetland of you know, international importance with an, uh, you know, the numbers and quantities of uh, various water birds that are present here. Um, the site is also a, a, a real rarity hotspot and many, many sort of serious mega rarities have been found here over the years and sort of almost without fail year on year it produces a handful of really, really exciting species. So this just sort of shows um, the entire Ramsar site. So you can see it's Marivale is effectively a portion of the Blessbrook Sprait wetland that's formally conserved. But the entire um, Blessbrook Sprait sort of wetland is under the is conserved under the Ramsar site area, and this town, uh, sorry, this site is located near the town of Nigel, and we're now um, southeast of Johannesburg. So just to put it in perspective, um, you can see Marivale obviously with the red teardrop, sort of southeast of Johannesburg, below Springs, and just outside of the town of Nigel. This is where we go to access Marivale Bird Sanctuary. So Marivel is, is um, just really such a phenomenal birding site. A, a vast wide array of uh, water birds can be seen here, along with some others as well. So it's a good place for owls like this marsh owl. Um, usually easiest to see during the winter months when they often quarter well into the, the mornings and in the afternoons. You know, sometimes at 10 o'clock in the morning, the marsh owls are still quartering over the edges of the wetland and the, the rank grassy patches. And even sometimes by three o'clock in the afternoon, they're starting to get active as well. So, but marsh owls are um, reliably sorted Marivale. This is also a good site for the, um, you know, the, the quite comical black heron with a very unique um, sort of feeding display where they flap their wings sort of over, over the head, form a bit of a shade spot and then hunt their uh, fish prey and such um, from that. So uh, just a bit of useless information, you know, I was actually only fairly recently um, had a bird do that quite close to me and uh, the noise that it actually made, it was super loud. I was uh, a little bit shocked as how loud it, that whole process of bring, them bringing their wings uh, sort of up, up and down was. But um, yeah, black heron are one of the obviously uh, exciting birds to, to look for at Marivale. Um, so African, this uh, Marivale is a site that you know, produces a lot of um, really exciting relics. And birds like African rail are regularly sought here and are pretty reliable. As are things like red-chested flufftail, you know, um, yeah, another one of these um, sort of skulking birds, difficult to see, um, fairly easy to hear and such, but uh, Maribel is a good, uh, good place to, to track down these, um, these exciting birds. Um, sticking with uh, the relative theme, although this is technically a shorebird, I guess, is greater painted snipe. 
Um, they also are generally present in low numbers and low densities uh, in and around Maribel. And um, we're now going to touch on two of the more exciting relids that uh, occur here and um, can be sort of sought again during, um, during most years, most summers. Uh, the last couple of years have been particularly good for these birds, Balon's crake and its close relative striped crake. Both pretty uncommon um, species. Uh, striped spotted crake in particular is quite, quite rare. Um, and obviously, you know, with these relatives, you need a lot of uh, luck and patience is required to actually see these birds. So uh, Moribal is a, is a good place to try and track down several of these exciting um, skulking species. And um, sorry, guys, yeah, uh, Andrew's just let me know that we are um, quite well over our time frame. I'm not quite at the end of our talk um, just yet. Uh, there are still a few sites, um, you know, that I had envisioned us uh, running through. Um, so my apologies, yeah, obviously got a little bit carried away and went into too much detail for some of the sites out here. Um, but, um, you know, perhaps just uh, touching by, um, these Devon grasslands are another one of the exciting areas I'd like us to sort of very briefly touch on. Um, obviously, this is primarily a high felt sort of grassland dominated site. And uh, Lupin is a significantly large dam that always supports a big concentration of waterfowl. This is a site that's come to prominence in more recent years, um, sort of somewhat new. It was initially mentioned in the first book, but it's uh, received a lot more attention uh, recently and it's even been officially proclaimed as an IBA over the last um, few years. So just very briefly on the map, you can see here we are going southeast of Johannesburg. And then um, the site supports exciting birds like the endemic blue Quran, really good area, and one of the few areas within the wider Gauteng area where you can track down this bird, along with um, other sort of more nomadic birds like pink bald lark, very good area to track down the nomadic pink bald lark. We also have pale crown cysticula. Uh, they are obviously more easy to see during the summer months when they're displaying and calling, but this is also one of the few areas of this wider Gauteng area where you can track down pale crown cysticula. Blue crane, South Africa's national bird, um, also are, are resident here in these sort of Devon grasslands. Um, obviously in the summer months, you know, they pair up and breed. Um, and during the winter months, they um, sort of form these uh, roaming, um, non-breeding flocks. They can sometimes number, you know, many birds, often uh, 150 or, or more species, you know, or, uh, or individuals, I should say. So sometimes they form these vast flocks during the winter months. and um, much to our excitement, you know, there's uh, been a wattled crane that's been joining this big flock of blue cranes during the winter months um, over the last few years. It's um, not seen every year, but uh, as these birds are sort of very easily disturbed and not always uh, on, you know, accessible land, um, the roads that crisscross this area aren't always, uh, you can't always view all the, all the valleys and all the areas, so the, the birds are often out of view. But, um, you know, for, for several years now, maybe the last decade or so, there's been a wattle crane that regularly winters with a flock of blue crane that's present around this area. The summer months, of course, bring in um, Montague's Harrier, uh, an exciting um, sort of summer migrant. And the winter months bring in the exciting Black Harrier. So this is obviously um, another one of these winter altitudinal migrants that move into the area. Um, so yeah, also an exciting bird to look at around here. Um, so we're just gonna, there's just a few more sites I want to touch us, I want to touch base on here guys. And um, you'll see I have an asterisk here with this Boone's Roadside Route. And this is one of the, the new sites that we, we're going to look at focusing on, on in the Wairakha Tang book. And it's um, a really exciting birding site. You know, this is now on the western side of Johannesburg. And although it is still primarily a grassland dominated site, there's a significantly more Karoo influence here. The, the grassland is much drier grassland. Um, you know, it's not this sort of typical moist, dense, high felt grassland that we're a bit more used to. So just to show you on the map, you can see we're now well west of Johannesburg, sort of north of Coltonville and south of Rustenburg. And um, this site was put on the map when Rufus Yed Warblers were found here also about a decade or so ago. You know, now this is, um, uh, this is an exceptionally significant find because this is a, a through and through Karoo special. And you get this bird, you can actually even find them within the borders of Gauteng province, which is also just totally ridiculous. Just blows, blows your mind away. But um, 
So these rufous eared warblers seem to be really localized, only occur in sort of a small area, maybe within about a 10 kilometer area of sort of suitable habitat. You can find rufous eared warblers within this area. So uh, super exciting. And with all the birding um, this sort of brought about, birds like the Macrosangras were also actually found here, you know, another one of these sort of Western species. This bird has been sort of found to be more a winter visitor. They visit during the winter months, um, you know, and they tend to be a bit more obvious during particularly dry winter months when the, the Kalahari and the Karui are, are very, very dry. They're very dry, harsh winters, um, drier than previous years, and more birds seem to push further east and occur in this area. Um, desert cysticula also occur quite widely in these sort of drier grasslands, um, as do chestnut-backed sparrowlark, um, another one of these sort of somewhat difficult species. And then um, not sticking with the trend, but little bee eater, a bird we associate with more moister areas, um, often also more subtropical areas, Kruger, KZN and such. Little bee eaters actually, actually do surprisingly well in this area as well. And there's a, a lot of uh, small colonies at some of the small um, quarries and such. The little bee eaters uh, are, uh, this is a really good area to track down this bird. And then the last of the new sites that I, I want us to touch base on is the Wall Dam and Northern Free State routes. So this area has also come to prominence over the last few years with a few significant finds. And um, although somewhat similar to the Devon grasslands, uh, in that they also host things like blue Quran and, uh, and such. These birds also have, um, the grasslands around here are generally a bit drier. They have a little bit more of a Karoo influence. Um, so they support a slightly different sort of suit of birds. Uh, so you can see again, here we are on the, the map. So you can see we, we're quite far south of Johannesburg. So we outside of the borders of Gauteng province itself. We are still within the 100 kilometer zone area. And we're sort of between the towns of Heilbronn and Frankfurt and the Val Dam. There's a, a vast network of roads that work this area, but otherwise it's generally private land. And, um, you know, you bird this area by driving along all these sort of gravel um, roads that crisscross this, this region. So one of the most exciting birds that occur here is double-banded corsa. Again, a bird that, um, you know, you initially can't quite fathom occurs right on the, the doorstep of Gauteng province. As you know, you often associate this bird with like the, the stony plains of the Northern Cape, for example. But double banded course are actually very reliable in this area. And they're not particularly uncommon. You know, you can often get them quite widely throughout this area. This is also the easternmost range of Orange River White Eye. Um, you know, this is also a more Western bird that occur sort of following the Orange River westwards um, up and then into Namibia as well. So this is the easternmost point where you uh, get this get this bird. Swallowtail beta are one of these winter birds that move in kind of from the um, Karoo and Kalahari areas. So they have a particular fondness for clumps of gum trees or eucalyptus um, where they sort of, um, sort of um, winter within, um, interestingly enough. So uh, whenever you're exploring gum trees in this area during winter months, it's always worth keeping an eye open for swallowtail bee eaters. And then um, super excitingly, Karoo scrub robins have also been found to be winter visitors to this area. Although they've only been found in very low numbers and in sort of very few localized sites, um, further exploration will probably reveal more Karoo scrub robins during the winter months in this area. And um, this bird is sort of starting to increase in numbers a little bit in this bottom area, particularly near the southeastern area around Frankfurt, between Frankfurt and the N3. Southern bald ibis are starting to push into this area a little bit now. And uh, I'm sure in a few years, they'll be a little bit more commonplace. So for now, they are still, you know, it's an ex super exciting, a super exciting find um, for, for that particular area and this Val Dam site. And they, they, are, they do seem to be uh, sort of restricted to that very southeastern area. But, um, you know, it's another exciting bird to watch for in these areas. So um, I'm just going to skip through these next few sites. These were just, I was going to, if we had the time, touch base on a few of the slightly further afield sites. So not strictly within the, the 100K and um, wider Gauteng area. Um, obviously the Burning Gauteng book also has a further afield chapter where we look at sites that are sort of a comfortable weekend destination away. So I was just going to briefly touch on a few of the, the, the new sites that we're looking at incorporating there. Things, places like Ngula Nature Reserve, fantastic uh, reserve 
um, just off the N3 between Harry Smith and Lady Smith. Wonderful Heifelt uh, Drakensberg sort of um, area. So we'll just sort of quickly run through it with yellow breasted pipits um, occurring in uh, large numbers there, breeding, of course. Whereas like black winged lapwing also featuring. Obviously, the site has uh, breeding wattle cranes, which is um, especially significant, you know, given this bird's critically endangered status in South Africa. So any um, con like conserved area that has these birds breeding is, is um, truly fantastic. Further Drakensberg birds like Buff Street Chats, Alpine Swift, Cape Vulture, and even Bearded Vulture, you know, occur in this area. So it's one of these exciting sites, um, slightly further afield, um, as is the Botsolano Game Reserve, another one of these really unknown reserves that don't receive a lot of attention, but well worth it. This is obviously a reserve that's quite close to the um, Botswana border, on sort of not even three hours from Pretoria. And it's an excellent site for the difficult short-clawed lark, along with tinkling cysticula, you know, birds that are difficult and frequently missed. Um, Kalahari birds like virtual sangrass also filter through into this area. Um, while the reserve also supports a big population of leopard-faced vultures that breed here, along with white-backed vultures. And it's also the closest place to Johannesburg for sociable weavers. So to think, you know, less than three hours from Gauteng, you can be seeing sociable weavers. Uh, again, you know, pretty, pretty spectacular and pretty interesting. But anyway, um, thank you guys. This brings us to the end of the uh, talk and presentation. And just apologies in advance to Andrew. Um, I had initially said I had to cut down my talk quite significantly because I was afraid of going overboard. Um, and I see I went quite far overboard. So thanks to those of you who stuck with it. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, Dylan, you did a fantastic job. And I think the overall consensus in the chat box was that everyone was enjoying it so much that no one really noticed the time passing. And I can certainly echo that. You did a really fantastic presentation. You're a very natural presenter, clearly an incredibly knowledgeable um, guy in this area and obviously further afield being a global bird guide now. And um, I must also just compliment your, your images. I think most of those were your photographs, if I'm not wrong. Um, if not all your own photographs, and I think everyone will agree. There's some pretty incredible shots in there, and I saw Penny Abbott's particularly jealous of your river warbler, which might not be the might not be the best aesthetic photo in the lot, but it's certainly probably one of your most treasured, I imagine. <laughs> yes, no, wonderful. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, thanks to all the folks for your wonderful comments as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to send you the, the, the chat box copy um, once we're done here, just so you can go through them. There's a lot of them filtering in through now. Um, it is uh, after half past eight. We usually close at half past eight, but I am going to take a couple of the questions that are in the chat box now, um, just because I think uh, everyone wants to know what you have to say and wants to pick your brain. Um, I must also, um, Dylan's a very, very humble, humble man. And I must say that he, he is one of Birding Eco Tour's premier guides. Birding Eco Tours is one of BirdLife South Africa's recommended tour operators. And Dylan is based in Joburg and is available to take you to all of these wonderful destinations and as you can see he has an incredible local knowledge of which birds are where and, and how to find you all the difficult birds so if you are wanting to um, make use of Dylan's services you can through birding eco tours and um, Dylan correct me if I'm wrong but I think I can probably email info at birdingecotours.com. Yeah spot on thanks Andrew that, that that's uh, that, that's perfect yeah wonderful. All right so um, thanks everyone for tuning in we um, you, I am going to encourage you to fill in our post-webinar survey, as always. It helps us to keep track of what your interests are, what you've enjoyed, what you've not enjoyed. Um, I think there's been overwhelmingly positive feedback on this one, Dylan. So we might be setting some, some records on our stats. We'll see tomorrow morning. Um, but uh, yeah, please do tune in next week as well, everyone. We've got uh, Roger Nashen from Canon, uh, South Africa, and he's going to be talking about mirrorless camera technology. Um, and on to uh, camera technology. I'm going to um, indulge in some nepotism and go to my father's question first. I saw he's got some lens envy done and he just wants to know what you're shooting with. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe somewhat polarizing, but I have a Nikon D500 camera and I have the 500, uh, fixed 500 um, PF lens that Nikon have as well. Thanks for letting us know. And uh, Penny Abbott wants to know, importantly, um, well, firstly, she says it's very clear that everyone watching tonight must get a copy of the new book once it's out. And uh, when, when can we expect to see it? 
Um, so yeah, great. Thanks, Penny. It would be wonderful, you know, to to have uh, your support. Um, so we we hope to have the book uh, finalized and published by the end of the year. But um, you know, the three of us, Etienne, Fanti, and myself, are also um, exceptionally busy. Um, with there's a, a lot of work on the go. So um, it may it may not come to pass that we we get it out before the end of the year. But we we certainly hope to try and stick um, to our sort of end of the year uh, time frame. Thanks very much, Dylan. I'm looking forward to that and I'll, I'll get myself a signed copy as soon as they're out. Um, Desiree Cantor wants to know, um, all the sites you talked about, um, what is the road access like? Can you go in a sedan or do you need high clearance or 4x4? Four four? Um, so, sorry, Andrew, could you just re repeat that? Was that a four specific site? Um, um, no, just across the different sites, are there any ones that have sort of access restrictions? Um, so, out of the sites that I, I went through, all are, the only issue is, um, I guess, in Combo Dam. Um, that's just due to the, the sort of the very fluctuating nature of the, the dam edge and the floodplain that's around it. So that's, that's one where 4x4s, four I guess, are perhaps more advised. Um, just because, you know, if you're in smaller sedan vehicles, sometimes there's a little patch of mud and you can get stuck through, throughout there. So that's the only one that might be a bit more um, required. It is possible, you know, with some sort of careful driving, you can usually navigate that area, even in a sedan. I've done it in my um, sedan as well, and years gone by. Um, but all the other sites are easily accessible by a sort of sedan cars. 4x4 four is um, not necessarily required. And, and similarly, all the different sites you mentioned, um, Craig Green would like to know, from a safety point of view, could uh, two people go out just for a day visit, or should you go out in groups? Yeah, so look, birding is always obviously tricky. You know, it's quite a, a high value item for lack of a better perhaps description. You know, binoculars are expensive, cameras are expensive. So, um, you know, and uh, there, there's a, a lot of petty theft in South Africa, you know, with uh, folks making use of, you know, opportunistic crime and such. So, you know, just being aware is always absolutely key. Um, so, you know, touch wood, I've not had any issues um, out birding in all of these areas. I do a lot of this birding myself, you know, in my own sort of spare time. But uh, generally, if you're aware and you have a small group, um, you should be safe most of the time. But, you know, as always, just try to be aware, as aware as possible and always practice as many sort of safety measures as, as possible. You know, don't leave stuff visible and out in the open and all of the sort of general best safety practice rules apply. Cool. Thanks, Dylan. Um, there's uh, two questions here from George the Deck. The first one is any reliable spots for monotonous lark in wider Gauteng? And the second one is any reliable place and or method to see African grass owl without causing undue disturbance? Um, I'll start with the easy one, monotonous lark. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, they're also one of these sort of semi-unknown birds. You know, they kind of pop up during the summer periods after rains when they display and they're vocal and pretty easy to see and then disappear in the winter months. Um, there's, there's a few good areas to look, but they're also quite nomadic. You know, they sort of a little bit localized. If a particular patch has had some good rain, they'll sort of uh, erupt into that area, um, you know, which, which might be five kilometers or 10 kilometers different from previous years. So we, we have good knowledge and generally if you uh, go at the right time of the year and explore a broader area, we can often find monotonous larks reliably. Um, sometimes it takes a bit of work, um, however. But as for the grass owl one, yeah, that's tricky. Um, obviously, you know, seeing birds um, shouldn't come at the, the cost of undue disturbance to species. So grass owl is, uh, is a really tricky one. There are several sites for this bird around, um, in and around Gauteng. Obviously, folks try to keep sites a little bit under wrap, uh, under wraps. Um, but uh, yeah, there's you okay. You can occasionally get a, a little bit lucky, like on the Sekerbos um, Iandruck Road, Sekerbos Run Nature Reserve on the south side of Johannesburg. It's a publicly accessible gravel road that runs through. Occasionally, you know, we we do bump into the bird just randomly feeding out on the road. Um, there's also a sort of a row of uh, fences, and sometimes we've had them just sort of perched up on that area. So generally to see this bird without causing any un undue disturbance, it is possible and there are places you can try your luck, but it, it effectively does just boil down to um, sort of being in the right place at the right time and a good dose of luck, 
you know, finding the bird perched on a fence or with it having to happening to cross in front of your vehicle or whatever the case is. Yeah, thanks very much. That is a tricky one. And I know it's uh, Melissa, my co-host on Conservation Conversations, Bogey Bird. Um, she, she gets the krills every time someone mentions African grass owl. Um, two more questions for you, Dylan. Um, the one is, again, from Penny Abbott. Um, she wants to know, you know, the Spotted Crake, which is quite a famous rarity at Maribel at the moment, it's uh, performing quite well. Um, do you think it's always there or is it a regular sort of vagrant to, Mar to Maribel? Yeah, so um, look, obviously uh, it's, uh, the water levels at Maribel also do fluctuate quite a bit. And um, I, I'm confident that Spotted Crakes are annual on the Blessed Book Sprite. Um, exactly where they are seen just varies year on year, but for... Um, probably most years in the last five or six years, there's been spotted crakes um, seen at Maryvale, uh, you know, every season. So I'm confident they're there annually, you know, just sometimes it, uh, they're obviously in different sites depending on the uh, sort of water levels and levels of mud flats and vegetation and, and such, which vary um, annually. So with enough looking around um, and exploring enough appropriate habitat, I'm sure you will get them every year, every summer. Yeah, and they, they seem to, to either becoming uh, more and more regular or uh, people are becoming more and more familiar with the birds and are picking them out. Um, I don't know which, which one it is or if it's a combination of the two, but they do seem to be becoming almost annual, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, probably a combination of both, I think. Probably more eyes out there, more people aware of them, more people seeing them, and I'm sure probably just greater numbers of birds um, moving down. Thanks very much. And the last question for the evening before I let you go is an interesting one from Matt. Um, he says, many birds shown are in the acacia thorn felt areas. Are there any documented injuries to birds from these thorns? Ooh, yeah, interesting question, Matt. Um, there's no documented injuries that I'm aware of, but, um, you know, I think a lot of these birds are, are generally pretty nimble in the in, in these acacia trees, especially when it comes to the smaller birds, you know, the pendulum tits and, and aeromomulas and, and such, you know, I don't think they would be, um, suffer too many injuries. Maybe they'd get the odd feather pulled out if they get sort of caught up on a, in a tree. Um, I think, you know, some of the larger birds might have more issues. They might be more prone to these things like go away birds and hornballs and such. You know, if something spooks them, if a uh, Shikra or Gabar goshawk, you know, were to fly through and all the birds kind of scatter and the go away bird had to dive into the middle of a tree, I'm sure it would probably lose a few, a few feathers. Um, but I don't think it would cause, unless maybe in exceptional circumstances, a lot of undue harm to the birds. Yeah, I think that was a really good considered answer. I hadn't thought of some of those situations. And when I saw that question come up, I immediately just thought of those um, southern fiscal larders with little sparrows and things impaled on acacia thorns and locusts and mice and all the rest. I mean, they, they certainly are sharp and they can cause danger, but the birds that live in those habitats regularly, I think, are, are pretty well adapted. Um, yeah, but a nice nice question, Matthew. You made, you made both of us think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, so that brings us to the close. There's no more questions as far as I can see. Um, so, Dylan, thank you again. Um, for a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, don't feel bad about going over time. It was definitely a quality presentation and everyone uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, certainly one of our best, and I think uh, a really good addition to our birding in our major cities in South Africa, every tourism series that we've been running. Uh, next month we have Paula Kwane, and Daniel Engelbrecht from Birding Africa is gonna be giving that presentation. So watch out for that, and uh, next week is as I said, Roger Mashin from Canon South Africa is going to talk about mirrorless technology and what it is and whether you should think about converting or not. Um, so thanks, Dylan. Thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. I hope you had a fantastic evening and that you have a fantastic evening further. <laughs>